So it's kind of like surreal. Like, awesome, awesome. So um, we usually do an introduction in the beginning. Um, so the introduction we're going to use is basically from your website. So mm -hmm. we'll just read that disclaimer in the beginning. And then afterwards, we'll ask about 20 to 30 questions. Pretty informal, so you don't have to like be feel any pressure or anything to answer the questions. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty simple questions. Um, and so right before we start, I'm just going to just say, welcome Kwaku Sambri to the show. All right. Okay. Great. Okay. Was that right? Mm -hmm. All right. Today we have a special guest um, who is from Washington, D.C. Welcome to the show, Kwaku Sambri. Thank you. Thank you, Hondi. Thank you, Philip, for having me. No problem. Appreciate no problem. So how old were you when you entered uh, your music life? Um, 23 now. I would, I would say those who knew me for my entire life would say that I entered music around one or two. Wow. Um, my, my mom tells me, tells the story of anytime she would bring me around the drums or dance class, I would stop kicking. There would be no kicking. It would just be silence. And she would be touching around, making sure everything is okay. <laughs> but apparently I was just listening and taking it all in. Um, so yeah, one or two. I actually remember that either you were three or four when I first started seeing you drum. <laughs> yeah. So basically your whole life, which is pretty amazing. Uh, who inspired you to make music? Initially, I would say, from what I can remember, my uncle, who was my teacher, <clears throat> and my mom. My mom inspired me to make music because she used to sing um, background vocals and black notes like a long time ago. And I remember, I vividly remember being at a rehearsal and saying like, okay, I could do this. I could be in, just be in rehearsal, like, you know. Wow. So yeah, my, my mother and my uncle, my uncle is my, my djembe teacher. He put the drum into my life, so those two people. So you come from a, um... I guess a musical family. Yes, <clears throat> heavy on the percussion side, but yes, a very musical family. Even on both sides of my family, my mother and my father, um, very musical family. Hmm. What kind of uh, music do you listen to? Um, it depends on the day. Like, um, I listen to like <clears throat> kind of like extremes. So, like, I'll listen. I'll be listening to like Alice Coltrane. And then I'll be listening to like Money Man, like who's like a, a, I guess, scam rapper. He's a rapper from Atlanta. I just appreciate his music and his grind because he's totally independent. And he doesn't talk about killing people. He just talks about making money illegally and uh, living a vegetarian lifestyle. So, Does that inspire your own personal music? Yes, it does. Um, I want my music to be, how do I put it? like um, high level and content in terms of not just the lyrics, but also in terms of the music, like the chord changes and the rhythms. But I always want my listeners to be able to clap and dance to it. Mm. So it's like kind of having the best of both worlds all the time. <clears throat> and also letting go of that too, letting go of that, um, the, the need to feel like my music should sound a certain way and just create based off of how I'm feeling. So, yeah. So for our non-musicians that are listening, what types of instruments do percussionists play? What kind of instruments do you play? Okay, yeah. So um, percussion could be defined as any instrument you have to strike. So a lot of people like to make the argument <clears throat> that, you know, a uh the piano is a the piano is a percussive instrument because you strike the piano mm -hmm. a lot of people say the piano is like a drum because you're striking it um i pretty much play all percussion in, all percussive instruments so I, I i um i play my first instrument uh that i ever started playing was the djembe drum and it's a hand drum you mm -hmm. play with your hands you play with these these this part of your hand okay. you play like that um my second instrument will probably be the dun dun drums, which you play with your sticks, which you mm -hmm. play with the sticks. And then 
after that, I just kind of stuck with that. And then after I watched Drumline, I just fell in love with the snare drum. Mm -hmm. My father and my mom put some money together and bought me a snare drum. And I was just, I just wanted to be like Devin, Nick Cannon off of Drumline. I learned all the rudiments and everything. Wow. And then and then I went on to studying orchestral percussion, and that's what you the most I guess classical forms of percussion. You have the timpani, which is the kettle drum, which you can tune to different pitches. Then you have um, you know your snare drum and your concert bass drum, your cymbals and your auxiliary percussion. And then you mm -hmm. also have your marimba, xylophone, and vibraphone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was able to study all of those instruments in high school. Wow. Very cool. So do you um, <clears throat> take those different elements and inf infuse it into the music that you produce today? Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah, at, all of the elements, um, especially with, uh, oh, I miss one, drum set too, the drum mm -hmm. set, combine all of those. Um, but yeah, I take, I take um, the things that I learned from, especially in the, West African percussive world and combining it with the technique and quote unquote professionalism. I don't really like to use it, but it is true. I learned how to be a professional in the orchestral setting by, you know, not playing when the, the, the conductor is speaking or giving instructions. Mm -hmm. um, so mixing the professionalism from that world and the technique like having everything be precise and you know exactly what you're playing and being able to read, um, my reading ability. And then with the, the drum set stuff, um, kind of like delving into jazz taught me how to listen, taught me how to listen a lot more, um, checking out different types of music, um, and also in, had a big influence on my reading, my reading capability, being able to sight read music somebody puts music you've never seen in front of you right in front of you and you just gotta mm. you know, gotta read how important is it to know the history of whatever instrument that you're playing oh it's very very it's super important um jason moran a piano player jason moran who's the director of jazz the director of jazz at the kennedy center i believe i think that's still his title there he told me once, he said, um, whenever you feel like the string that connects you to your roots of a genre of music, whenever you feel like the string is dwindling or it's stretching a little bit too far, you have to immediately put everything down and go back and like kind of retie that string and mm -hmm. you know, make sure that it's strengthened because when you lose touch with, your, with the roots of the music that you learn to play, you start to, you're basically taking things for granted. You're mm -hmm. basically taking um, the creator's gifts bestowed upon you for granted. Yeah. Out of all those different genres uh, you previously explained, which is your favorite to, um, to <laughs> perform? Uh, to perform? Yeah. Um, like on stage, like, cause I, I, I don't really have a favorite, but if you, if I'm being specific to like a setting, Mm. On stage, ah oh, man, it's it's, just, it's a just tie. A, the just the type of energy that um is responded to what you're doing. Like, what's what's the the favorite type of energy you've respond uh you gain from an audience depending on the genre you play? Most definitely when I'm playing djembe. Most <laughs> yeah. definitely, I, I I just people just go crazy. Like yeah. you know what I'm saying? I, I've seen people throw like somebody I never know throw. Five hundred dollars on me and my cousin when we was like mass young, but we were playing hard. But then, and then mm -hmm. I started to get older, and then you just see how the the the, the drum touches people, um, and you see how people kind of are drawn to your spirit, and specifically talking to myself, drawn mm -hmm. to my spirit and my sound. I I had to grow comfortable with that. I, didn't, I I'm still kind of not comfortable with people telling me like, oh my god, like the way you hit the drum, it just does something to me. I'm just like, okay, like all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But we yeah. heard you. We heard you at um, my granddad's memorial, and that was yeah. the first time I heard you after like I don't know, maybe fifteen or ten years. Yeah, like since you were a kid, and I was just like, oh my gosh! Like you feel something the moment you play the djembe, and it's so 
it's so powerful it's almost religious in a sense it's a very spiritual yeah. feeling it talks yeah. to your spirit yeah um i mean from an early age i i, I would do crazy things with the drum like i mm-hmm. I, I i i would sleep with my drum like wow. bef- like before i ever had a girlfriend like i'm talking like age six seven eight i would be sleeping with my drum mm-hmm. just like spending all of my time with my drum i would come home finish my homework and i was zoom through my homework like i would zoom through it would be right <laughs> and i would just play my drum in the living room until like the sh- like the sun st- like the sun was is moving until it's mm. dinner time pretty much mm. so like I would just sit there and play one thing close my eyes until I felt like I was on the other side of the room so I would do that a lot yeah it's amazing how you said that because my last sentence was going to say that it was almost like I was hearing your voice but it was a drum you know like mm. you were talking through the drum yeah it's amazing so what is your creative process like Um, I would say my creative process is based on experience. I I really, I really love to make music about my feelings. Like it's something that I love to do. It's a, it's a coping mechanism. It's therapy for me. Um, but most recently, I've been I've I've, I've gotten um, commissioned to write some music. So like having to change gears and mm make music for a specific group of people, a specific setting, a specific um, instrumentation. It's been challenging, um, but back to the question, my creative process, before I start creating anything or if, normally I'll just, I'll, 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 like something will come to me and I'll sing it in my voice memos. And then um, I'll just keep listening to it. And then I, I, I meditate a lot. I spend a lot of time mm-hmm. on my own and I sit for a very long time. I've been doing this since 2000. My daughter was born in 2000, since 2018. Mm-hmm. 2018, I was living in Jersey City and I, I, I just sit for a long time by myself and I breathe and the music will just come to me. Like the, mm-hmm. the song that I, that, that, that I sung in my voice memo, it will still be in my mind. And then the rest of it kind of will be added on. Um, and I kind of combined those two processes, like I was saying, with you know writing for specific groups of people. Or if I'm commissioned to write something, I I just I kind of just like play around with on a keyboard or something like that until I kind of come up with a motif or an idea, and then I I leave it alone, and then I just go back living my life, and then the rest of it will come to me later. So is it like <clears throat> the idea is? already there in the ether you just bring yourself to a point where you just grab for it when you're meditating absolutely mm-hmm. the idea is always in the ether i mean there, like i can literally like i wake up like it, i love to do this i don't do it every day it's just not possible um i love to wake up and just sit behind the drums like wake up okay maybe i do 50 push-ups 50 crunches and then brush my teeth and then the first thing I do before I take any food, before I take anything, before I put anything in my in my body, I love to just sit at the drums. I'll sit mm. at the drums and warm up, just mm. playing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have a practice regimen, and this is on the drum set. Um, and then maybe an idea will come to me on the drum set, like a phrase or a group of phrases, and I'll just play those over and over again. And then if possible, if I have access to my gym there, or any type of hand percussion instrument, I'll go to that and then play the same thing, just trying to hear it from a different seat, hearing Mm -hmm. it from a different perspective. Um, And then after that, I'll go to the keyboard and do stuff like that. But yeah, I just grab it out of the ether pretty much. I feel like if I focus, if I do my regiment, if I do everything I'm supposed to do, then I'll always have access to those different um, musical ideas. Mm -hmm. So what's the process of being uh, commissioned for uh, working with other people? Um, is it um, networking or? It's, it's based off of networking. And then I think it's all probably based off of like your reputation and resume. Mm-hmm. Um, so like what, what I'm specifically talking about, I got commissioned to write a piece for 
this virtual music festival called the Free Assembly Music mm -hmm. Festival, um, curated by Metrop the Metropolis Orchestra. I, it's an orchestra based out of the UK, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and they select the artists to do the commissioning. Like they selected different artists to pick different artists. Mm -hmm. And one of oh. the artists, they, you see, like one of the artists they selected, um, I play in his band and we happen to be roommates. And he's like, nah, like Kweku should do this. Like you should write for cello and viola and play djembe, like something just completely different. So the, the whole music festival is based around um, combining different worlds of music Mm -hmm. um, bringing them together and uh, combining different worlds of music and mix, I guess, using a mixed media platform, like combining it with uh, video. So mm -hmm. I wrote a piece for cello, viola, and then I played djembe and a whole bunch of other percussion. And then I put together the video too. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. What countries have your, has your music taken you to? Africa, Europe, Australia. Mm. Um, oh, wait, you said countries. I listed continents. It's okay, because I was about to ask what countries <laughs> in that continent. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, Guinea, Guinea, West Africa, um, Ghana. I've been to Spain, Italy, Slovakia, Slovenia, Kosovo, Prishna. Um, What's that? That's Prishna. That, that that's that's in Kosovo. Okay. Krishna is in Kosovo. But mm -hmm. I what's the Mo, Norway. I've been to Norway, Molde, mm -hmm. Norway, and then some Turkey and then uh up there. Some more of those <laughs> Eastern, <laughs> some uh, those Eastern European countries mm -hmm. are kinda like all jumbled together. up together. And then I've been to Melbourne, um and New Zealand. I went to okay. New Zealand too. Nice. So, so yeah. how many continents would that be? That was Africa uh europe have you been to asia i've not been to asia not yet, yet. I, can oh. I, I want to go to tokyo <laughs> yeah. south america i've never yeah. been to south america either okay so which band or musician would you most like to collaborate with if you haven't already Ooh, that's a good question like uh can i you might you guys mind if i name like three whatever whatever um I really want to collaborate with Burna Boy. Mm. Um, Derek Hodge is a bass player. Mm. And vocalist, super killing vocalist I like to listen to. Um, oh, I mean, I like, like, I like SZA. Um, Who's really singing right now? Yeah, I would just leave it at those three. Mm -hmm. I'll just leave it at those three. So who are your top five favorite drummers? Or your top drum uh, favorite drummers, period? Um, I do like a span of different instruments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dead or Alive doesn't, doesn't, Dead doesn't or matter. Alive. Elvin okay. Jones, he's mm -hmm. the drummer for John Coltrane. Mm -hmm. Mama Dikata, he's master djembe player. Um, Numa Dikata, no relations, master djembe player who died very early. He was the mm. best, in my opinion. Um, ooh, Giovanni Hildago, Hildago from Puerto Rico, I think. He's a conga player, mm -hmm. percussionist, and. Mm, 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 mm. Ed Blackwell, another jazz drummer. Okay. Influenced my style. So this is a very similar question to the one before, but if you could open a show for someone, who would it be? Ooh, Travis Scott. His show yeah. is crazy. <laughs> so it's Travis. Travis go crazy. I love his shows. And Beyonce. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yep. She's She is a very great performer. Yeah, she's the best. Mm-hmm. 
what would you be doing right now if it wasn't for your music career? I'll probably be an engineer, mm -hmm. um, scientist, engineer, or a writer. Um, I was I was really really into like science in middle school. I won like three science fairs. Like, I was just like into like science, like just figuring out stuff. Like okay, well I like I did a, a project on animals affect music's effect on animals' behavior. I like got a whole bunch of gerbils and mm. like blasted music on one of them, no music on the other, and music on only certain days. Like I I'm, I, I like like testing stuff and getting the results and just like finding stuff finding out new things about stuff that people may already know about but mm. you know um and i like taking things apart and putting them back together and then taking them apart again so probably engineer an engineer okay. writing coding something like that it's very interesting you say that because i believe that um percussion and science and mathematics are the same thing, but two different languages. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much everything around us uh, revolves around waveforms. And mm -hmm. um, I was reading a study on how certain music could influence a plant to thrive or certain negative music could influence a plant to die, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, just the mathematics behind percussion and reading music is, 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 is very similar in itself too, you know? So that's very interesting. You said that. Not only yeah. that, maybe your scientific interests still are within music mm. because um, perhaps like you make a mistake, how do you handle that? And is it a sort sort of calculation or a scientific like <laughs> experiment right. with you having to catch up with somebody and figure out how to solve the problem? Right. But, um, that was my next question, actually. How do you handle um, mistakes in a performance? Whether you make it or somebody else does, how do you kind of put it back together? Um, well, first off, the f one thing that I, the one of the most important things I learned in music school, in high school, was that the first beat and the last beat matter most. Mm -hmm. So how you start a song, how you end it. Mm -hmm. Everything else of course it matters, but those two, you have to have right. So you, we don't mess up on the beginning, we don't mess up at the end. Secondly, um, mistakes are okay because mistakes give you, give room for other things to grow. Because you already know what's, if, you, if you're practicing, you know what to expect. You know, okay, it's gonna go like this, and then we're gonna go left, and then we're gonna go right, and then we're gonna go up, and then we're gonna go down. But, you know, as a professional, um, things happen. You're on stage. Maybe one member of the band doesn't move on to the next section. The bass player mm -hmm. may stay. So I have to use my ears and be like, okay, the bass player is staying. I'm the drummer. Let me, let me, let's stay here for another four measures or another system, another uh, two stanzas or whatever it is. Um, we'll stay there. And then the next time we go on. Or it would be like that mistake just allowed just turned into like a new section of the song that happens all the time all the time like a mistake turns into a new section of the song um a new groove something like that mm -hmm. and it's just about being able to stay open to those type of experiment ex experiences on stage i think that's the beauty of music you know like there's really no such thing as wrong notes Mm -hmm. Really no such thing as wrong. I think Miles said that. Miles Davis said that, I think. Um, you know, it's all about the note that you played before and the note that you're going to play after. There's no such thing as a wrong note. So if I play Kuda in the wrong spot, technically, but the way I resolve the phrase, you know, just me resolving the phrase allows it to be something new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know you've been uh, performing for years since you were a kid but do you ever get nervous before you perform every time <laughs> every time every time every time every literally every time it, i'll be like uh, i'm good and right before <laughs> like no matter what instrument i'll be playing djembe i've been playing djembe i'm 23 i've been playing djembe for 22 years like solid mm. and every time it doesn't matter the performance the show when i strap my drum up and i'm about to 
I get that little butterfly feeling in my stomach and I'm just like, ooh, showtime, yeah. you know? So every time, every single time. What advice would you give to beginners who are nervous or anyone that's in the music industry that needs a little assistance with not being as nervous? Practice on performance. Stage? Mm. practice performing in your practice room and your practice setup whatever you have you know um you practice performing you you stand you walk into the room you say thank you imagine there's an audience thank you i me my sister and i used to do this when i was younger we used to practice performing mm. we would practice doing everything practice our combs practice performing as if we had an audience mm -hmm. so um and then as I got older and I, 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 I had that issue I, every time before a show, when I first moved to New York, I would be nervous and it would kind of like make me make m way more mistakes. And a teacher told me to practice performing. You walk in, after you finish learning the song, you stand up, you go get a drink of water. You walk in as if this the show. You walk in, you practice your walk, you sit down and you start. Every time you mess up, you start over. Mm. so you just practice performing mm. um and then eventually you get better at it mm. how often and how long do you practice a set um right now i'm practicing every day i wake up in the morning and i practice for 40 minutes and then i come to my practice studio i'm probably here for like it's been ridiculous probably like four to like eight hours or something mm. um and it's not all just practicing one thing i'm recording music here make writing music making music um tracking drums tracking percussion for other people's music so i would say definitely at least four hours a day four hours a day at least four hours a day mm. um how do you balance your music with other obligations you have a beautiful daughter, you have other things that are going on in life. So how do you like prioritize music, but also including other things that are going on? You start the day earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's something that I like, I don't have any obvious, I don't have, it's obviously a struggle for me, but uh, I just start the day early, earlier. Um, and sometimes that doesn't work out. Um, and I think it's, it's about ebb and flow, like not, being so hard on yourself if you didn't practice or if you didn't do something you were supposed to do for your art or mm -hmm. for your craft um, and allowing those moments that you spend with your family or your other obligations, allowing them to like influence uh, what is influential momentum. Like get, it's mm -hmm. giving you, if you do every task the best to your ability, no matter what, that momentum carries into the next task. So if I'm with my daughter and okay, we're playing with slime, right? And I'm BSing on a slime play and I, cause I got my phone out or something. Like if I just put my phone down and put all of my energy toward playing with slime and doing the activity that I'm doing with her, then after we finish that momentum of me, you know, solely focusing on that one thing will carry over into the next activity that I have mm. my schedule. So, yeah, those two things, um, waking up earlier and focusing your intention on activity at hand to create momentum for yourself. Mm, that's deep, man. Um, how do you feel the internet has impacted the music business? Uh, are, am I allowed to curse? Yeah, yeah. you can do whatever yeah, you want. I mean, it fucked it up. It fucked yeah. it up in, in a good and a bad way. Literally, it got everything got fucked up in the good and the bad way. Because let's start with the good. The good thing is that um, I can go downstairs right now, write a bomb ass song, record the video, put it out, and by next Tuesday, it's I'm I'm viral. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a viral moment, and which which would create more opportunities for me to display my craft, display my art bad thing is that now people solely practice and create for the internet mm. and when you do that you are doing a disservice to yourself in my opinion as an artist because you're not 
covering the full spectrum of what your craft is about. You have like being in the practice room is about facing, not facing your demons, but you got to sit there and face you. Like you're not supposed to sound good in the practice room. So if Mm -hmm. all you're thinking about is sounding good for the internet, then you kind of, you, you creating, it's like a crutch. It's like, it's not good. It's not Mm -hmm. good at all. If you just, you know, doing things for the internet. And then on top of that, the whole streaming game and people mm-hmm. not really buying records. It's crazy. And then you got these platforms that are paying artists zero point zero 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 close to nothing per download, per stream. And it's not making it easier with coronavirus paired with it because us artists can't tour. We can't mm-hmm. make money off tours. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that the internet has fucked it up in both ways. But as if you're a true artist, you got to look at it. I had to step back and look at it. And the new game is content creation. So just mixed media. How do I do videos and music? Okay, how do I do videos, music, and memes? Like, okay, how do I do, you know, how do I combine all of those different worlds um, to my advantage as an artist? So the mixed media game and yeah, content creation. So there's often a debate surrounding whether an artist that wants to pursue a career in the arts should go to pursue an education in that field. Um, What are your thoughts on that? And do you believe that you would have gotten the same experiences, opportunities, and um, I guess overall knowledge about your craft if you had not been in the new school or Duke Ellington? Um, so just share a little bit of your thoughts around that. Um, if going, if you want to be a musician, going to school won't stop, won't make or break you. Mm-hmm. That's first. Especially now, going to school will not make or break you as a musician. Any school, high school or college. Um, with high school. I would rather someone who wants to be a musician, I would rather them go, if they had to choose between the two, I'd rather them go to high school for music Mm -hmm. because more than likely it's going to be free. And then Mm -hmm. you are, you are creating, if you, you know, as long as you have great teachers, which most music schools have really good teachers, you're learning to create good habits and consistency early on. Mm -hmm. And when you are, 14 to 18 there are less distractions mm. you have less distractions you, and you have less responsibility naturally because you know hopefully you're living with responsible adults who are taking care of all of that adulting stuff so all you have to do is focus on getting the grades and practicing your instrument um with the collegiate lane i don't if you're if you have to pay to go to music school i would suggest you not I would suggest you go to if you are if you want to go to school, um, you go to school for a trade or uh, you know get a scholarship to do something. Um, go to school to code, but nowadays it's like who like you don't have to go to college for anything. Like you literally don't. After I graduated from my master's, I just like signed up for like some extra courses, just learning on edX, just learning different shit, like. Um, you really don't have to go to school to make it. Um, so I think that, you know, if you're, if you want to go to college to pursue the arts, the school should be paying you to go to school. They Mm -hmm. should be making the way for you to go to school. Oh shit. Sorry. Somebody called me. Um, um, the school should be paying you to, to go to school. Why is my, sorry. We all cut it out. My uncle is calling me and he's outside, but I'm in here. Going in. Okay. Well, um, we have two more questions. Um, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. So school should be paying for your tuition point blank period. If you want to go to our school, that's my opinion because they're making money off of you. Mm. Period. So, um, yeah, that's my take on it. Was networking in college important to you? Or just making those, I guess, friends or people who are in the, the same similar space as you uh was that important yeah at the new school yeah 
Um, I, it depends on the school. At the new school, yes. Everybody and their mama go to, has, has went to the new school. So when you say, oh, yeah, I went to new school, it's like, oh, okay, so you know X, Y, and Z, you know this person. Um, I can't tell you how many gigs I've gotten just by being at the new school. Mm. Um, I've gotten a lot of um, – so networking, it, that networking aspect with art school is important, but everybody who goes to art school doesn't network. I didn't, I didn't automatically start networking because I went to school. I net, I started networking because of, to be honest, with who my father is. Like just mm. being around my dad. Like that's how he's made uh, his life for himself by being able to have a conversation with pretty much anyone, mm. and that conversation leading to a business endeavor or somebody giving you money or somebody pledging money to you or pledging to collaborate with you on something. So networking doesn't have anything to do with school. Networking has to do with your mindset mm. and the setting that you're in. So I can network in jail. I can network, you know what I'm saying? I can network anywhere. Mm. Um, but I think it's about your mindset. What's the best advice you've ever been given? Focus. Yep. Just stay focused. <laughs> <laughs> um, I asked somebody that uh, it, it's pretty much it. Yeah, stay for oh no 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 no. Uh, the best advice is probably through deep breaths, all things are possible. Like mm. you know, breathing, all things are possible. But breathing and focus is connected. So, mm. I mean, but you know, through deep breaths or correct breathing, all things are possible. Mm. So, uh, what's next for you um, after this uh, lockdown is, is is gone? What what would you like to do next? Um, I would probably be. Okay, um, I'm going to interview. Gotcha. Oh, thank you. I would probably after the lockdown. Oh, um, my 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 percussion ensemble is putting out a record soon. So prayerfully we'll be able to tour mm -hmm. that record. Um, and then I'm going to be recording like three other albums, not my albums, three other, I guess, big projects with other people. And then I'm looking to put out an EP mm -hmm. of my own music. And then I will be managing our studios here at Dinko Culture Art Studios. I'll be working here, just on the ground managing that, um, which I'm doing now. I'm working here now, but um, you know, when things open back up, I guess I would be, you know, all hands on with that. So yeah, those things: touring, working here with my family's business, of course, my daughter, nonstop, um, and yeah, recording. So how can people keep in touch with you? For those that are listening that want to just, you know, follow your journey, uh, if you have a social media handle, if you can share those things with us. Okay. Um, yeah, you can, you guys can keep up, keep in touch with me at, um, on Instagram and on Facebook. I'm also on LinkedIn. Anybody else, you know, LinkedIn is great. Um, on Instagram, I'm at the equation. That's T H E K W A E S H I A N the equation. Um, or you could just type in my first and last name, it'll come up. And on Facebook, I'm also first and last name, uh, LinkedIn, first, last name, Kwaku Sumbri. Um, and you can go to my website and it's kwakusumbri.com. Perfect. Thank you so much for Thank being you. on the show with us today. It was such a pleasure and we're so honored to have you. Thank you. Thank you. The pleasure's all mine. I really love this. Thank all you. All right. Take care. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. You too. Bye.